one. Hi, good evening everybody. I'm Jenica Davis Hockett and tonight we're going to be doing a presentation on uh, called Beyond Im These are complementary, complementary models to the uh, youth empowerment model that we've been using in Unitarian Universalism uh, in our youth ministry. So this is part of the Pacific Western Region's Good News in Youth Ministry series. We are going to run until 7.45 Pacific, 8.45 Mountain Time tonight. So like I said, I'm Jenica Davis Hockett. I'm the Youth Ministry Specialist for the Pacific Western Region, and I work primarily with Pacific Northwest District and Mountain Desert District. And here's a more uh, serious picture. There we go. <laughs> So my personal vision is that every Unitarian Universalist youth has a dependable support network that acknowledges their inherent worth and dignity and fosters their potential as spiritual leaders. And I also envision every UU adult in that network having the wisdom and the compassion and the support to meet that call. So I want to start with uh, um, a chalice lighting by one of my very favorite Sufi poets, Hafiz. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say, love me. Of course, you do not do this out. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this great pull in us to why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying, with that sweet moon language, what every other eye in the world is dying to hear? And Beth says, my, my audio is cutting in and out. Is anybody else having trouble? Uh-oh, Sarah is too... All right, maybe we should pause and I'll call on the phone. So, tonight we're gonna to be talking about the limitations of using the UU Youth Empowerment Model all by itself. It's not that it's a bad model, it's not that we're gonna throw it out. It's worked for us, it's continuing to work for us, but there are some new complementary models that, that will bring new light to this youth empowerment model. So as we're going through, um, feel free to post questions or comments, anything at all in the chat box, and I'll make sure to save a little chunks of time throughout the webinar to be able to address those. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end as well to talk about it. So the millennial generation, or those often known as the 9-11 generation, are seeking new ways to be ministered by congregations. The truth is that a lot of our youth are actually over-empowered. They've got all their, their uh, school groups. They're, they're really driven to succeed in their school, in high school. Some are even taking college classes and are gearing up to, to go to college. And coming of age uh, in, right in the midst of an economic crisis is really enough to reevaluate the need to continue um, a, a youth ministry program that is oftentimes really high pressure. You know, I just finished a couple of cons uh, led by youth, and to have those um, youth tell me at every check-in, I'm exhausted, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overworked, I'm totally stressed out, to ask them to run an entire con was not ministry at all. So, we're going to start tonight. I'm going to turn my camera off in a little bit, but I just want to do a couple more slides. We're going to start tonight with a brief history of uh, how we as Unitarian Universalists came to herald this youth empowerment model of youth ministry. And then we're going to talk about, a I'll make these slides bigger in just a second. We're going to talk about a couple of different models. One, the first one is relational youth ministry. And this is really about having uh, authentic, vulnerable relationships at the heart of ministry. So relationships are both the means and the ends. 
in this relational youth ministry. It's all about transformation through relationships. After that, we're going to talk about Mark Iaconelli's um, contemplative youth ministry. And this is where we're putting the mission of the church right at the very center of youth ministry. So we're taking out all the, all the uh, fluff, so to speak, and really focusing primarily on the spiritual growth and spiritual well-being, the nourishing souls of our youth. And we're going to talk about uh, what's called Youth Ministry 3.0, also called Third Wave Ministry. And in this model, we're just throwing out the old model of youth group, that there's one size fits all, that, um, that Sunday morning or Sunday night youth group can meet all of the needs and the ministry needs of, of our youth today. Uh, so we're going to try a different approach altogether there. So after we look at these three new models. We're going to find, uh, we're going to discover new ways how they fit into our life as Unitarian Universalists and do some, figure out some practices around those. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off so that we can see the pictures a little better. So we're going to start back in the day. In the early 1900s, the Young People's Christian Union, which was the Unitarian, or sorry, the Universalist Youth Movement, and the Young People's Religious Union, which was the Unitarian Movement, in those two groups, young meant up to 35 years old. So empowerment was designed for a di very different youth culture, a very different societal structure, and a totally different age range. And as youth culture evolved, in the 1940s, the Universalist Youth Federation and the American Unitarian Youth, this is before Unitarianism and Universalism came together, the age range was 13 to 25. So. We know now, it was a little bit shorter, and we know now that it's at about 25 years old that uh, the, the human brain is fully developed, but it's still quite a big age range. And in 1954, with the liberal religious youth, the age was shrunk just a little more to uh, uh, the 12 to 22 years old. But the reason that I'm starting here is because I want you to see two things. One that youth empowerment came into being when the age range was really quite huge. And people who are 35 are much more ready and able and poised to take on the major leadership roles that we're often asking younger people to take on today. And two, and this is really the, the most important one, is that youth and adults have always been in partnership in Unitarian Universalist Youth Ministry. They've always been in relationship with each other, always been working together, empowering each other. It's just then back in the day, we called them all youth, and now we consider youth to be high school age range from about 14 to 18 or 19. So when we're talking about adult, youth-adult partnerships, that's nothing really uh, new or revolutionary. It's just we're, we've defined the age ranges differently. And of course, I want to start by talking about why youth empowerment is awesome, because I want to make sure that I'm not uh, asking our ministers, our DREs, our advisors to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we have a good thing going here. So obviously, the primary purpose of youth empowerment is, is to empower youth. But the other goal, the other or the secondary goal of youth empowerment is really to awa raise awareness about the needs for cultural shifts within our congregations towards more inclusivity. And it's our youth empowerment is designed to give youth a voice, to give them a meaningful place in our congregations, and to recognize them as whole people, capable and worthy of participation in congregational life. We have a really great system that's working. We need empowered youth to do exceptional UU youth ministry. 
we've we've set up a wonderful culture where youth are leading by example and youth are the ones that they themselves have been waiting for. There's no need any longer to to put that uh, the need for change onto anybody else. They're willing to take the reins and change the world themselves. And when done covenantally, youth empowerment is a, is a very important model in helping youth develop leadership skills. So you can see in this model, this, this uh, model is available in the Youth Ministry Advising uh, Complete Guide that the Youth and Young Adult Office just put out, and it's also available in the Renaissance module for Youth Ministry. The amount of leadership is in direct correlation to the growth and the maturity and the development and leadership capacity of the youth. So, so in this model, you can see down at the bottom and the top, it's never wholly and completely either youth leading or adults leading. It's always youth and adults leading in partnership. And at the beginning stages, adults have more of the reins. And as youth become more comfortable with leadership, and they gain the skills that they need, they are able to take on more seri serious roles. But it's always with the intention of doing it in companionship. Within youth empowerment, when it's working, youth empowerment, this is straight from the Summit on Youth Ministry Report in 2007, so it's a little old, but it's still this definition of youth empowerment is really great. Youth empowerment is a covenantal practice in which youth are safe, recognized, and affirmed as full and vital participants in the life of our shared Unitarian Universalist faith community. This covenantal practice is based on the following set of guiding principles, and this slide has the first three. Love and trust between youth and adults, between youth and youth, and between adults and adults. Mentoring relationships among children, youth, and adults, which draw from direct experience and wisdom. And third, the development of youth confidence and self-identity through building community, learning to use one's voice effectively, and realizing a more robust expression of themselves. It is also the encouragement for all to grow together in accountability. Youth defining their issues and participating in the decisions that impact youth, uh, impact youth communities, and their larger multi-generational communities that we share. And youth and adults having access to in information through direct and honest communication expressed with grace, humility, and respect. And last, trust in the competence of youth and the authenticity of their insight, appreciation of the prophetic wisdom and energy of youth to be agents of social change, justice, and service, and the recognition that youth ministry is an integral Unitarian Universalist ministry and part of our collective past, present, and future. So we're not messing around with, with youth empowerment. This is really... Uh, something that, that has a lot of meat to its bones. I want to make sure I'm not dismissing that, that at all, but I, I do want to say that I truly believe that youth empowerment is not enough for a fulfilling Unitarian Universalist youth ministry. One of the reasons that youth empowerment is not enough is because the very idea of youth empowerment suggests that youth are disempowered, that that's the starting place that we're at with our youth is that they're disempowered and that the goal is to gain power. And when, uh, as I was saying, when youth empowerment is done covenantally, the power is not over, but the power is within or power with. But oftentimes when you... Uh, youth empowerment is not done correctly, it can be uh, 
used as a power game. And it suggests that we're kind of uh, in a battle between those who get it and those who don't. And it's about uh, this old model of trying to gain equality, not through building relationships, but by gaining uh, rights to the adult world in our congregation. So before I go on, I just want to make sure I'm not missing any questions or concerns. So feel free to um, tap those at your leisure, and we'll get to them whenever you're, uh, whenever we have a stopping point. So there are three foundational elements to uh, to adolescent development. The first, these are in no particular order. Uh, the first is identity. That's the big question of who am I? Who am I as a Unitarian Universalist? Who am I as part of this family? Who am I at my school? This, these are complex. These are not um, homogeneous identities. These are complex and ever-shifting identities. The second is autonomy. This is a youth's need to um, stand out, to be unique, to be different, to be individual. This is how identity is expressed. And the third is affinity. There's that little um, duckling trying to fit in with the geese. Affinity is who do I belong to? Where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And it used to be with this youth or what this youth empowerment model is based on, it used to be, uh, especially with with Generation X, with baby boomers, that the crux of adolescent development was autonomy, was trying to figure out how you are unique, how you are different, how you stand out. And with an ever-changing world where uh, we have been subdivided and subdivided again into smaller and smaller niche markets. It's actually, uh, and where, especially I think in Unitarian Universalist circles where uh, identity and autonomy, individuality is really prized, youth today, the millennial generation, isn't as concerned with autonomy as they are with affinity, with being able to fit in, being able to belong. So if we're taking a look at youth ministry with this core need to belong at the center rather than the core need to be to stand out and be different at the center, that's going to change the way we look at youth ministry. So in these affinity categories, you know, you've got your uh, you've you've got small subgroups, small subcultures, and they're definitely represented in all of our congregations. And just, you know, for a semi-funny example, you've got your hipsters, you've got your nerds, and you've got your hipster nerds. So when we have all of these um, smaller groups, all of these affinity groups within our youth ministry, what are the best ways that we can meet those ministry needs without having to develop programs for all of these small affinity groups, without continuing to divide into smaller and smaller subcategories, and recognizing that congregations are really one of the last places in our culture that doesn't either intentionally or unintentionally intentionally segregate down affinity lines, either by age group or class or uh, gender or sexuality. We are con especially Unitarian Universalist congregations are places that we can come together to cross those affinity lines. So how do we do that in youth ministry? The first one I want to talk about is relational youth ministry. And I'm getting my information based on a book by Andrew Root. And I have a little resource um, 
session for you that I'll email to you within the week or at the beginning of next week. So um, don't worry, this book will definitely be in there. So like I said, Relational Youth Ministry is not actually about going anywhere, developing anything, changing anything. Relational Youth Ministry is a goal in and of itself. Relationships are a goal in and of themselves. So I want to start with a little video, which means that I will stop sharing my screen so that I can share this video with you. This is a video of Peter Morales talking about why relationships are the most important thing that we have right now.
So that was Peter Morales. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint now. Um, and if you were unable to hear that, he's basically saying that we are the most isolated humans in history, despite all of the all of the social networking and uh, technological communications that have advanced, we find ourselves to be more and more isolated. So relational youth ministry meets that isolation with a sense of community and a sense of ex actually experiencing God or the mystery, not just learning about it or hearing about it. So in this relational youth ministry, this, this is uh, relationships between youth and between youth and adults. And it's not just the simple connections that develop at cons. It's not the once a week at youth group. It's not talking with people at coffee hour. These are deep, compassionate, and uh, vulnerable relationships. These are relationships where we're willing to be vulnerably empathetic. So this means meeting youth where they're at, not just with their joys, but with their brokenness as well. And it's in these deep relationships that we are really able to see the transformative power of love. So in relation, relational youth ministry, unlike youth empowerment, youth empowerment is not the goal. Youth empowerment is a benefit of being in deep relations with uh, youth in your youth group. The goal is transformation. And we're going to have some more time to talk about each of these as we go into the practices. I want to talk now a little bit about contemplative youth ministry. So while in relational youth ministry, the, the, the process is, um, is about the, the heavily seated in the community building aspect of youth ministry, growing so our contemplative youth ministry is more in the spiritual discipline aspect of growing souls, of youth ministry. And youth ministry is starting with ministry to adults. So that's what's really different from uh, anything, honestly, that I've experienced in youth ministry, either as an advisor or now as youth ministry specialist, is ministry to youth actually starts with the adults. So in this, in this model, it's really about slowing down, showing up, shutting up, and feeding the soul. It's about taking away the flesh, like I said, and really focusing on the spiritual disciplines of meditation and prayer, of communal worship, of personal spiritual practices. And it's also about discernment about sitting down and listening to the quiet voice within. And in this model, adults are uh, can actively care about youth without actually being directly involved in youth ministry. So those adults that are directly involved in youth ministry are um, also meeting themselves, either in small group ministry or in prayer circles or in something, in some way that is enriching and developing their own transformation as Unitarian Universalists. And it's from that place that they're willing to meet and be with youth so that they can companion youth in their own spiritual transformation. And for those adults that are not 
uh, interested in directly being involved with youth, either as an advisor or a sponsor or a youth ministry coordinator, they are still part of youth ministry. The whole This is a whole congregation process. Mark Iaconelli actually talked about prayer circles for um, what he calls adult advocates or youth advocates. And this group gets a series of prayer cards which have the name and the picture of the youth in the youth group with a little identifying information. And this group meets in a covenant circle once a month and holds those youth in their heart without actually ever even having to meet them in person. And that way, at coffee hour on Sunday, they can, they can recognize them, greet them by name, and the youth minister, with the permission of the youth, will um, talk with this prayer circle and give them any updated information on a youth that's having a difficult time or needs some uh, specific pastoral care. And this adult community, all they are in charge of is keeping these youth in their hearts. And in his particular story, these adults have been together for generations of youth ministry, uh, being that youth uh, ministry is usually a four-year generation. And they've grown deeper as a community, and eventually they grow closer to and less afraid of the youth group. So before we go on to Youth Ministry 3.0, are there any questions? Any clarifying points, go ahead and feel free to put those into the chat box. So in Youth Ministry 3.0, or the third wave youth ministry, millennials know that there is something to live for beyond con consuming church programs. And I don't know if you have heard this idea of programs as just a consumption model where people come in, they get exactly what is right for them, and they uh, leave without feeling that deep sense of being able to contribute to a beloved community. It's something that they just get to consume and walk away from. Millennials know that uh, with a life that's built on consumption, that's built on their specific identity, that there's something more out there. And they want to belong to something that isn't necessarily specifically designed to meet theirs and only their needs, but they want to belong to something that's bigger than themselves. So this Youth Ministry 3.0 suggests that ministry can, is no longer one size fits all. So it's, it's a slight paradox. Youth know in their heart that there is something bigger out there than just their own needs, their own desires, and yet the youth, and yet Mark Ostricher, who is the author of Youth Ministry 3.0, knows that just Sunday youth programs one hour a week is no longer enough, is no longer wide enough and no longer deep enough to meet the ministry needs of our youth. And I want to go back just a moment to talk about those prayer circles. Deanna Hoyle says, many in our congregation don't pray. So do you have a suggestion for adults holding youth in another way? And Beth Peebles responds with meditation. Um, there's many ways to disguise prayer. You could also just call it what it is, and for those that are able to be open to that language, they can tune into that. I think another word could easily be um, maybe like a concern circle or a witness circle, something that suggests that you are in a space to care for you, to be um, without being necessarily responsible or accountable to use. A caring circle could also work.
So in this ministry 3.0 model, it's really moving into a true community or a beloved community. Um, Ostricher uses the word communion to suggest that we are actually we're moving towards their interests and creating circles around those interests rather than trying to do the uh, a vacuum sucking them into our interests. So in this model, for example, instead of trying to recreate a social justice project for the two outspoken youth in your youth group that are interested in social justice, you would connect them. First step would be connecting them to the social justice ministries in your congregation, and that alone is not enough. You would then connect them specifically with one or two members in that group that can create, that can build a relationship with those youth and not necessarily based solely on social justice, but on another mutual common interest. So the, it's the interest that draws them in, it's the relationships that are built that transcend these affinity groups or these interest groups. So now I want to talk about putting this into practice. This is definitely my favorite part of thinking about these concepts is integrating them into, into um, the working world of a congregation. It's sort of like a puzzle or a challenge to figure out, one, what we're willing to let go of, what we're willing to do differently, and two, how to do this realistically given the time that we have to dedicate, the energy that we have to get dedicate, and the uh, system as it is working right now in our congregation. So first I want to talk a little bit about uh, relational youth ministry. In this model of, of creating space for relationships to be transcendent, adults really have to get it. This is not something that uh, you can use the warm body approach of finding uh, advisors or sponsors or mentors. This is a place, uh, this is a time when you are going to have to do some serious training with your advisors on the complexities around boundaries, holding safe boundaries for themselves as well as setting a good example for youth. Um, Root talks about the openness and closedness of a relationship, that to be open and vulnerable as an advisor is also to be able to be closed, to be able to set limitations and boundaries to the relationship. So this isn't uh, necessarily a peer-to-peer -peer friendship at all. This is still a uh, a mentoring relationship. They've also got to be able to get power dynamics, going back to uh, integrating this with youth empowerment to be able to understand their natural power as adults with more experience and more access to more information and resources in our communities and in our congregations and be able to work on building power with and power within youth as, as they're in relationship. And these adults have to also be, uh, have a high level of integrity. They have to be grounded, they have to be uh, grounded in their own spiritual self and their own spiritual practice, and they also have to be courageous, going back to that empathetic, uh, vulnerable empathy. To be able to be with somebody not just in their strengths and in celebration, but also in their um, deepest and their darkest uh, moments. I'll give you the dates towards the end of this webinar, but I highly, highly recommend sending your adults as well as your youth to chaplain training. We've got two uh, in the Pacific Western region this year. And at these chaplain trainings, you will learn 
not necessarily how to be the be-all and end-all of pastoral care for you, so you will learn how to be a deep listener and to some practices to find your own center, your own grounding, so that you can have the strength to be with you in dark moments as well as in lightness and celebration. And the last point in this practice part for relational youth ministry is that uh, adults will only have authentic, vulnerably empathetic relationships with a few youth. So that means that you're going to need more adult companions. If you have one advisor, uh, that advisor is just not going to be able to meet the ministry needs of being in relationship with all youth. So the advisor is responsible primarily to the group and to be able to have an advisor team as well as advocates or mentors. And Beth is saying where do parents fit into this model? Parents would make excellent adult companions. I know plenty of congregations that actually have youth, uh, have small group ministry for parents of youth specifically, and that would fit into uh, getting adults who get it, to be together, to be developing their own spiritual disciplines, to be able to accompany youth. So in the uh, contemplative youth ministry model, the primary question is how do we create space for God for the mystery? So, so many times we think about filling space. Okay, we've got an hour on Sunday night, so we're going to start with a check-in, then we're going to do a chalice lighting, then we're going to do programming, then we're going to do free time, then we're going to do a closing. And that's how we structure our time. And same with cons. We set a schedule. Same with Sunday service. We set a very, very rigid schedule and follow it. And oftentimes, those schedules uh, are in place to create a sense of familiarity. Well, in this question, how do we create space for God? We're making space in our ministry for the unfamiliar. In contemplative youth ministry, there are principles of Sabbath, prayer, covenant community, and accompaniment. So Sabbath is really that, that element of slowing down, using Sunday as an actual day of rest. The whole, uh, the whole point of contemplative youth ministry is to bring the nourishment, bring the replenishment and the rejuvenation back into ministry. Prayer or meditation um, or also just that time for quietly listening to the still voice within. Covenant community, I think a lot of our youth groups do a very good job of this already, um, to have that small group ministry style of, of Sunday group or Wednesday night group, whatever it may be. And covenant community also includes the widening circle. So you have a covenanted community of parents, you have a covenanted community of religious educators, uh, teachers, and advisors. Uh, you have a covenant, covenanted community that includes your minister, that includes other members of the congregation that are seeking to be uh, with youth on varying levels. And you have accompaniment. So that is the one-on-one -on -one or the very small group mentorship of youth and adults. And Contemplative Youth Ministry also follows the principles of discernment. So this is how every uh, every year could start, also every meeting could start with some simple time to listen to not uh, what is the curriculum telling me to do, what is my uh, supervisor telling me to do, what are the parents telling me to do, what are the youth asking me to do, telling me to do. This is what is, what is the spirit telling me to do. 
as an advisor, what am I what am I being called to bring to this community? And it's also a good thing to help uh, guide your youth in as well. Not what's the cool thing to do, or or what what is the easy thing to do, or what is the quick thing to do? But how can we, as a group, support each other in doing not just things right, but in doing the right things? Hospitality is another principle of contemplative youth ministry. This is something that I think, uh, especially at Pacific Northwest and Mountain Desert District cons, they do incredibly well. This idea of radical hospitality that not despite but because of who you are, we welcome you and we celebrate you, and uh, we are also willing to adapt to create a space that is more comfortable and more welcoming for you. And that is a gift that I would hope, that I would wish that our youth could uh, bring into coffee hour, bring into Sunday service, bring into other committees in our congregation to help them uh, practice this rad radical hospitality as well. And the last one is authentic action, which I could do a whole webinar on that alone. Uh, speaks to beloved community that we uh, that that justice begins within. So authentic action is um, taking a step back from the desire to do social uh, to do social action to do service projects, and really beginning to build relationships with um, people with outside groups, outside of Unitarian Universalism, to create meaningful connection and lasting relationships. I'm going to pause there just to read um, Derby's question. Wouldn't parents be likely to bring their relationship issues with their child into the relationship with other youth? Um, Ruby, I think if I'm reading this right, you're suggesting that if there's um, something between the child and the parent, are they, is that parent then likely to transfer that onto, onto other youth in the group if they're um, working in a concern circle or a prayer circle? Yes. And that's where those chaplain trainings and other leadership trainings uh, could be really incredibly helpful because part of that chaplaincy training is actually being able to, to step back, to take a non-personal approach, and to really uh, recognize your own limits as a deep listener. So in the chaplaincy model, you're not providing solutions. You're not uh, stepping in and trying to fix things, but you're really allowing the person um, to come to their own realizations, their own truth. And if a parent isn't able to do that, then I think um, it would be wise to help them find another way of relating to youth and being in that specific mentoring relationship. And I just want to talk just a little bit more about the Youth Ministry 3.0, and then I'm going to wrap it up with some with some uh, themes that are running through these three, and then I'll open it up for questions. So in Youth Ministry 3.0, he's really suggesting to decentralize your youth group. So you might have a weekly, if you've got, uh, and this is all dependent on your congregation, so he gives no, no, um, measure of exactly how this is to be done because a large part of it is going in. He uses the term um, anthropological quite a bit in this book, going in as, as an anthropologist into your congregation and seeing what the needs of your young people are instead of prescribing uh, a program that has worked in the past. So to decentralize your youth group is perhaps to have one large uh, youth group that meets quarterly or biweekly, and then have a couple youth on your worship team or have a couple youth that are actually on a um, soulful sundown worship team or someplace where they're, they're getting to meet people 
that are outside that primary use group. And it can also mean meeting in ways that are brand new. So ways like we're meeting tonight. You can use a variety of technologies like Google Plus to actually do online meetings. I know that in Pacific Northwest, after every con, they're now organizing uh, Google Plus Hangouts to continue their touch group meetings. Another primary, primary part of Youth Ministry 3.0 is to do less, think small, and be simple. So this goes back to this is similar to in the relational, uh, in the covenantal, oh my gosh, in the um, contemplative <laughs> youth ministry um, model where everything is missional. Everything is missional. So if there is a program in youth ministry right now that is not meeting your church's mission, it's okay to not do it this year. And in thinking small, you're meeting the needs of youth individually or in very small groups instead of catering to either the lowest common denominator or catering to what uh, the dominant youth culture in your congregation. And be simple. Uh, there's a whole section in the book on the ministry of bowling and how Fun is one of the, the easiest ways to build relationships. And the last part of this is guiding youth in experiencing beloved community, God, and justice. So this is, this is actual um, experiences of the divine through community, through connection, instead of uh, the, the old lecture style of uh, telling or speaking about or hearing about the divine. So the things that are running through all three of these models and are also found in the uh, best quality of youth empowerment model as well, one is small group ministry that builds authentic relationships. So these are small group ministry for youth uh, perhaps around specific interests or perhaps as, as a whole group across affinities. And it's also small group ministry for adults that are directly involved in youth ministry as well as adults that are on the periphery of youth ministry in order to create transformed adults who can then be in relationship with youth. Another theme running through this is youth-adult companionship is not task-oriented. It's not about the next service project. It's not about the youth service at the end of the year. It's not about the overnighter. Youth-adult companionship is about youth-adult companionship. The relationship is the means and the end. Along that same vein, ministry is not about doing, but about being. Ministry is not about doing, oh my gosh, isn't that a relief? We don't have to add another task to our list. Ministry is not about doing, it's about being. It's about living with integrity and authenticity. It's about being in empathetic, uh, in vulnerable empathy with our youth. Another theme is that unconditional love transforms. Unconditional love transforms. Youth ministry belongs to the whole congregation in all three of these models. It's not just something that happens once a week. It's not something that happens opposite to service. It's something that the whole congregation understands as being vital to their survival, and to their beloved community. And speaking of beloved community, each of these models represents that idea that justice starts within. That if we can begin, that if we minister to ourselves and hold ourselves dear and hold each other dear, 
and we are able to take that transformation out into the world. And the last theme that runs through all of these is that millennials want to experience God. They want to experience the mystery. They want to be in the midst of the divine, and that happens oftentimes through relationships with one another. So I want to open it up to any questions, any comments, any curiosities on these models, on our youth empowerment model, anything that came up for you. And Derby says, are these four models covered in the six pillars of youth ministry? If not, what do you see as the difference? Well, I love the six pillars of youth ministry because they're a nice foundation. They're nice and uh, basic. And I have to admit, they're slightly forgettable, so I'm looking them up now. Um, I see these as expanding on these the six pillars. And also in uh, also expanding on the web of youth ministry, which is an expansion actually of of the six pillars. So in this web of youth ministry, we have covenantal relationships. spiritual development, pastoral care, identity formation, covenantal leadership, multi-generational leadership or relationships, faith exploration, and justice making. So that's the beautiful thing about, and also the overwhelming thing about these models, is they fit well with both the six pillars and the expanded web of youth ministry. and. Um, they're just a way of going a little deeper into these uh, nice, tidy packages that we have in the in our youth ministry advising. Thank you for that question, Derby. And I'll actually add the six pillars into the um, and the web into my handouts when I send them out, so that you can have that as well. Are there any other questions? Do we dare to unmute folks, Nancy or Lori, so they can type up if they'd like? I have some additional questions here, Jenica, that you might um, also address. Um, Beth is asking, if we decentralize the youth group, how do we nurture the peer-to-peer -peer relationships? Will it have an impact on the depth of those relationships? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a really good point. And I think that in in a culture that is, I want to make sure that I'm answering with the depth of the, the question, in a culture that in itself has been so decentralized when, I mean, I'm just looking at my, my uh, professional Facebook profile and I'm part of somewhere between 20 and 30 groups that are all talking about various uh, details of youth ministry or Unitarian Universalism. And what I've noticed is there's tons of cross-pollination. So I may be in the same group with, um, you know, I may be in up to five or six groups with some of the same people, but there's also different people in those groups. So it's, I think those peer-to-peer -peer relationships, you know, by decentralized, I, I most certainly don't mean dissolve. So those peer-to-peer -peer relationships are still incredibly important, and especially in a space where uh, it's, you know, a, quote, judgment-free zone, where, where youth are really getting the chance to be authentic with each other, which doesn't often happen in high schools. Um, I think that really to decentralize it is to create more of that goodness. And the depth of those relationships when they can become specialized 
yet not isolated, specialized yet not isolated, then they can uh, you can go deeper and yet still be able to cross pollinate with other groups. Does that answer your question? I think she'll send a, an, a follow up. A little earlier, Susan asked, could you say a little more about authentic action? She's concerned that she perhaps doesn't fully understand that. Mm. Authentic action is um, Mark Iaconelli's way of looking at um, the way that youth and youth groups engage with the world. So. Oftentimes, you know, the very base, simple of a service project um, that's a, you know, a, a one-off event that causes a little warm, fuzzy feelings in uh, most certainly the, the um, youth who are involved and perhaps with the groups that they're involved with. In this authentic action, it goes beyond that. So it's more, I can give you an example of something that was transformed into authentic action. So a couple of years ago, in um, the, the Western Cluster had a con, a conference for middle and high school youth, and it was a social justice, social action conference. And one of the projects was to go to the soup kitchen and deliver lunch. And it rolled out just like you um, would imagine with some very wide-eyed youth standing behind the um, very safe divide, dolloping, um, uh, you know, dinner onto folks' plates and really having, you know, some cordial thank yous, but not a whole lot after that. And uh, you could see that their minds were racing, that they wanted to know um, that, you know, they, they, their little minds were blown, but they didn't really have a container to hold it. And after dinner was served, they went to, um, they went to the back of the room. Some of them had brought their guitars with them, and some of the folks that had been served dinner also had their guitars. And they started playing music together. And that was the authentic action, because it was no longer about us and them. It was no longer about, um, you know, I am here to serve you, or you are here to reserve service. It was about creating relationship and connection across something that they had something in common about. So that's that's one very, very small, you know, afternoon example, but the book goes into a lot more detail on creating entire programs around that authentic action, that, that building those relation, uh, lasting relationships that um, with people that, that you can companion with outside of your congregation. Um, a little while back, um, I think it was Beth, Beth also asked, where do parents fit into this model? And I've, I've lost track of which particular model she was speaking of, but perhaps, Jenica, you could say something about the role of parents in, in each of the three models you've outlined for us tonight. Mm. In speaking, and this is, this is all... Um, um, that's what I'm looking for, I guess, antidote. This is not, I haven't uh, done a survey or massive research on this, but in the youth that I've spoken with, um, which is primarily on my leadership team, they want their parents to be involved in some way. They might not want their parents leading youth group or, um, you know, some of them aren't interested in having their, their parents sponsor a con, but they... This time is becoming more and more precious for for parents to spend with their kids and vice versa. And if Sunday is the place or church, whether it's on Sunday or not, uh, in Unitarian Universalism can be the place where parents and children can connect, parents and their youth can connect. Uh, I think that would be amazing. So one thing I suggested was to have a small group ministry for parents of youth Another idea is to have, you know, parents serving in youth ministry in more meaningful ways than, than uh, baking the cookies for the potluck. But to be, I mean, parents are whole human beings too, right? So if they're 
perhaps there's something uh, that they are volunteering with or that they were at their work that uh, would pique the interest of youth that may be their kids and may not be their children. That they can come and speak with the group, partner with the group on on uh, something that's beyond just their parenthood, but their humanity as well, in, in addition to their parenthood. I'm sorry that we've come to the end of our time, and so we probably should let Jenica um, do her wrap up, and, and then we will say goodnight. All right, I'll give you my contact information, and before I do, I just want to do a little uh, chalice extinguishing by another one of my favorite Sufi poets, Rumi. Wherever you are, whatever you do, be in love. So there's my... Um, oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. Finish. Okay. Um, there's my contact information. This cool new format, you can just click right on my name right from this slide and it'll go right to my email. Same with my phone number. Please don't call me right now, but you can call me <laughs> anytime during the day. Um, my next webinar in this um, Good News in Youth Ministry series is on small group ministry for advisors. So that is a perfect, perfect segue into. Um, how to begin to transform adults to create transformative relationships with you. It's December 4th, same time. And Nancy wants to remind folks that a survey will pop up when this meeting closes. And I seriously, I love uh, reading the comments and taking the feedback and the guidance so that my next uh, webinar can uh, move forward from there. So thank you, everyone, so much. And I look forward to seeing you on December 4th. Thank you, everybody. Please do fill out the survey. Save our little bobble with uh, Jenica's audio in the beginning, which we um, seem to have reconciled. I think the technology worked pretty well. But if you had particular challenges with it, it's always helpful for us to know that also. And I'll say good night and thank all of you for being with us. <laughs>